by well, no, but monochrome. Doesn't matter what color it is. As long as they're not the same color. Anyway, uh, since we're in here, do we want to start with the UE buy side? Since that's probably where we should be spending more of our time anyway. Yeah, I've added all the agenda stuff from the wiki into the uh, markdown uh, thing that was shared on the uh, in uh, Web Summit. Thank you. And I just, you know, it's just completely cut and paste. So, yeah. Well, this will allow it to evolve as we actually just talking about it all. Yeah, exactly. It's easier, in, in the other meetings I've done, it's easier to have the agenda and to either add items to the agenda stuff or to change the agenda stuff as things go on. So I'm hoping that will appear as well. Yep. Hello, Mr. Red Jersey Cat. Yeah. Uh, okay. I, I always saw the red jersey. Cookies for the wine. I'll eat some. I'm sorry, what? I brought cookies for you. Oh, thank you, Dan. I'm that was very thoughtful. I'll eat them for you, too. You could crumble them into oh, the keyboard. Oh, what a friend. <laughs> Are you going to that, too? Well, I could crumble them and put them into the keyboard like someone suggested. Uh, that kind of ruins them. And I, you know, I'd hate for such a generous gift to be ruined uh, in a vain attempt to get it to me. Not to mention his laptop. <laughs> yeah, Max, yeah, that would be destroyed too. Yeah, I was going to say, this version of Mac doesn't do well with crumbs on the keyboard. <laughs> Cookie drop. That is a biscuit. <laughs> this one can't go with dust level of crickets. Yeah. <clears throat> Though, right. Uh, so, Warner, can you tell us a little bit about how the fallback stuff for loader.efi works now? Yeah, I, I, I added this for work, and we might not actually use it at work, but um, what loader.efi does is very, very early. It determines what device it was loaded from. So it's either the ESP or the uh, FS or the ZFS partition. And from that partition, it reads EFI, FreeBSD, loader.env, and parses that like a, our old boot.config. I chose that file because in, EFI, in UEFI land, that's the only directory we own. It's the only place we can put files that won't conflict with other people. Um, so it reads that in. Um, you can set this if you have NV uh, variables. There's a variable you can set to override that. And then there's another variable um, that's next loader EMV. Um, it defaults to nothing, but if it's set, we'll read that file too and then delete that variable. So you have a little bit of boot next function in there. And the other things I've added are the ability to specify the um, root device using the UEFI path to that, the device path, uh, the media path to the device. Um, I added that as well. So um, those are the things that I've added. Um, and that covers, should cover most of the stuff we need for fallback. If there are other things we need, I'm happy to, to have a discussion or to, to implement those things. This part also pointed out that we don't have a loader.efi um, man page. So I did not document this. And the current loader man page is in need of updating, it doesn't mention Lua really, mm -hmm. and assumes everything is a fourth thing. So we need to do some work there. Um, if uh, you know people are looking for a documentation task, I was going to try to write it, but I, that's yeah, that happens very slowly for me. So um, I totally agree that it needs to be there. Though. I mean, it's it, it's just lack of time 
that I've not done that. And if it was just adding this to a man page, it'd be easy, but uh, rearranging all the technical debt here was beyond the amount of time I had available for this project. So that's where we stand with that right now. Is there a EFI NV variable for choosing which data set you want the loader to load from? No, that's all handled through boot environment. Um, I wrote up a, um, a extension media path for ZFS, but I've not implemented that. And that part of that would be to set the data set to be your root or to load from um, uh, in the UEFI bootloader stuff. Yeah, because I don't think the uh, ZFS boot CFG that, um, I think it was Alan Summers or Andrew Vermont that did it, uh, for BIOS boot where it basically writes the VFS.root.mount uh, from type syntax to uh, the ZFS label to let you say, you know, next time we boot, use this, uh, you know, uh, next boot, this boot environment. Uh, and since we have right, it's, I thought that we would we've dug that out from the Z pool that we found from the boot environment stuff that um, Kyle Levin says works so hard to make very configurable to be CTL. Uh, so that one does the default, but I don't think it supports the next boot. Uh, okay. Well, the the version that we we're using for the BIOS right now. Uh, so we need to determine if you can currently next boot a specific boot environment, and if not, add that. Uh, and it's just something we need to pass uh, from basically the EFI NV bear into the environment in the actual loader. Uh, and then it, can, it takes it from there and it ends up in the kernel environment. Uh, so it doesn't need that much processing, so it should be pretty straightforward. Okay. Um, so we need a, a ZFS data data set. Sorry. I'm not sure how much of that functionality is currently in the loader, so there may be some additional plumbing. I know you can select it through menus, but I don't know if um, there are convenient loader variables that exist. If those loader variables exist today, then loader.env will um, will be the vector that you can use to set those. And right. I think the they next do. functionality that I described earlier would be the way to get boot next with that. Yeah, uh, and I'm 80% sure that that already exists in the EFI loader uh, because the menus use those same variables to or populate those variables based on what you selected. So if you Populate them with something else that just changes what the default is in the menu. And so okay. most of the plumbing should already be there. And, uh, they should be pretty straightforward. Yeah, if it's, if it's purely UEFI variables that we're setting um, and that the ZFS file system that's in stand supports, then um, what I've done will be completely adequate. <laughs> if there are other things that are needed as hints that the current ZFS boot code sets that you can't put in a config file, then we would need to plumb that. Um, I think that, that, the other thing we need to plumb right. is, is making it erase it after a reset kind of thing, right? Because it's a next boot variable. Right, right. And unless the loader does that on its own, um, it's, you know, um, <clears throat> okay, so unless the, the, the loader does that on its own, I think you're right. But we could get the next boot through the UEFI variable that reads the, the config file in, but we don't have a ZFS native way to do that. And Kyle just typed in chat um, that the activate-t for BECTL only works with the MBR, which does ZFS boot config label writing, so it's not. Um, there's no UEFI support directly at the moment for that. Right. So, so that's something we will need to enhance. Yeah, and I think the, the straightforward approach to that is 
some way to set the EFI MD variable with the same content as what we currently write to the label uh, and somehow flag it so that when the EFI reads it, it also erases it and just passes it to loader as an environment variable. Uh, and then the menu will work with it and it'll plumb through everything the same plumbing. Right. The, the, the problem with that is we have no DOS writing ability right now, so we can't write DOS files. Right. But there's no config file. Like instead of instead of writing it to the label like we do for BIOS booting, we would just use the EFI variable, right? Right. We can right with the EFI variable I added. We can do that today because it automatically deletes the next loader EMD variable that we read from. So that that would give us next big functionality. Okay. So can we do so it? so that would work great for um, x86 installs. Mm -hmm. um, we one area that needs to have uh, MS DOS fat boot or MS DOS file system writing stuff is for like the ARM boards that don't have NVRAM that we either can take advantage of. Right. So so that that area is, needs some work. It looks like it's about a hundred ish lines of code to add that, and then we could uh, steal from uh, the. Uh, MS DOS file system we have in the kernel a little bit, but you know, steal uh, know how, not actual code, because the code bases are completely different. So, my question is the fail safe boot code, should that only allow us to change the driver we are booting from, like boot like now, or what is the real goal for this? Uh, well, the, the real goal for this is being able to safely update the actual boot code itself okay. uh, and being able to fail back with different boot code. Okay. Uh, because every time you have a new ZFS pool version, you need a newer boot code and you want to be able to, you know, get a BSD style fail back to the old one if your system yeah. wouldn't boot after you installed the new one. So you can make sure the new boot code works before you actually run Z pool upgrade. Uh, and, you know, in, in the nano BSD okay. style setup, the you never updated the UFS boot code. But the real, the real case is only with uh, with ZFS, or do we have any other use cases? Because um, why are you asking? Because I was uh, looking into doing something a little bit different, basically allowing user to use uh, checkpoints from boot uh, bootloader, mm -hmm. ZFS checkpoint. So if you would have such situation, you just look. Uh, back to the um, point of ZFS where you didn't upgrade your pool, so right. But the, currently, the boot code lives outside the pool, so it wouldn't be reverted by the checkpoint. Right, but but the problem is that boot code itself doesn't work. Yes. Yeah. Okay. That's what we're trying to solve. Is you install a new GBD ZFS boot for uh, loader.efi, okay. and it turns out that one doesn't like okay. your hardware or does something. And, uh, now you can't get to the, the loader menu to select a different boot environment or whatever to continue booting. Okay, I see. <clears throat> right, and there's there's a, a mechanism within uh, the UEFI standard that I wish we could use, which is the UEFI boot manager protocol. For many systems, we can um, use that and say. You know, boot loader dash new dot efi and have some scripting around that that moves it over when it's good. Um, the problem is that a lot of the systems, um, particularly super micro systems, interfere with setting the variables that you need to set to make that happen. So we can't um, use that uh, exactly um, on all systems reliably. Um, the other problem is in the embedded world where we don't have any loader, persistent loader variables to do anything with. So we would need um, some kind, if we wanted to do this, we would need some kind of IMD fail safe boot loader you never, ever, ever update, ever. Um, and it would decide what the, to load loader.efi. And right now, in the past, that's been boot one. But as 
its functionality has crept up. People have wanted to add selection to it and a bunch of other things. And the thought was, why not just use loader.efi for everything? And some of these use cases are showing that um, there may be a problem with doing that. Where we may want to go back to having a boot loader.efi that only job really is to pick between the other versions of loader.efi kind of thing. And definitely doesn't do things like try to understand that effect. Right. It's, yeah, I mean, we, 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 there, there are a number of, um, there are a number of solutions out in the Linux world. There's uh, Refined, there's uh, Shim, there's Fallback, there's three or four others, all of which have crappy licenses that we can't um, import um, today. I did um, find uh, Refit. Which is what Refine is based on is BSD license, but it's years and years old and not maintained, so it's probably not very useful. But. Right, right. Um, Rebecca on IRC corrected me that said Shim is actually BSD license. I must have looked at a different thing called Shim, but I'll, we can we can investigate that as well. We might be able to just import that um, to do the initial selection if we're worried about this, but. The, the thing that makes it a problem is um, that um, we have, you know, in the past, um, if we were to update loader and have a bad thing, we've got a, a, a previous stage in the boot where we could say, oh, just use loader.old uh, mm -hmm. and it'll load loader.old um, and we can do that. With UAFI, the notion is that there'd be a shell that people could escape to and load the loader.efi. Um, but the problem with that is there's a notion. It's not universally implemented and it's not universally um, bootable. It is on um, all the BIOSes I've dealt with, but evidently there's some that don't have that built in. So we can't hang our. Um, uh, Everything on that. So, uh, so yeah, so the, uh, the problem we're trying to solve is how to deal with we install new boot code and it maybe doesn't work. So, we want to have right. boot right. next lights so that we can install the new one, try it, and if it doesn't work, we know that we have to deal with that before we continue the upgrade process. Um, and we, more importantly, the machine comes back up automatically or with one remote power cycle, not with me having to get to the keyboard to fix it. Um, right. But right. This, this also presupposes, like as Warner has been complaining about, a way for you to actually update the boot code. Some common way so you don't have to know the intricacies of your system. In particular, when you run Zpool upgrade to upgrade to a newer version, it reminds you to install newer GPT set of boot. But the example command it gives you, if you happen to be booting from EFI, will tell you to overwrite your EFI partition with the new BIOS boot code. <laughs> yes, uh, I've, I've had to help a couple of people recover from that. I've got a patch that, you know, makes the warning message much longer and explains the two different situations, but people will be in one of you know many different configurations. Uh, and so how do we try to, I don't know, we don't want to try to guess which way that somebody's booting their computer, uh, but we do want to have a proper canonical way of updating the boot code on your computer. Uh, you know, we came up with, I think it was Steve Wills in, in the Sparks C support this morning was saying, you know, he was getting this error when trying to boot. He's like, oh, I, I've never updated my boot code since I installed this machine years ago. Because uh, it's not part of the handbook where it says, you know, you do make install world, all this, but it never can remind you to update your boot code. Because with UFS, the boot code never changed. It's <laughs> right. We're moving away from boot code never changes to boot code changes a lot. Yeah. And how do we make that transition? Um, is, uh, you know, is, 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 is really the, the problem. And, and I think. There's two pieces to this too. To, to the legacy side, you want to have 
you know, like two, two grip blocks in the ZFS pool, and you want to say, oh, for the moment, let's put out this other one. And if, and if that works, we copy it to the primary one. Or, you know, some protocol like that that tries it once. If it works, it makes it the new thing. And if it fails, you go back to the old thing um, without having to, you know, send somebody on site for a machine that doesn't have a, a head or something. That's, that's the, the, the problem we're trying to solve. We also have that problem in UEFI land because we want to update loader.efi all the time now. But um, if we do that and land that in the um, ESP and it's bad, the fallback is painful. And so we're wanting to, to work around that. And from that perspective, um, the stuff I described at the beginning, it may not be completely, um, it might not answer this problem completely. It answers the problem of the embedded world where we need to load stuff without depending on UEFI variables, but it doesn't answer the do it once um, side of things, um, particularly when we want to, you know, when we're, when we're doing this update. So, so can, so, can we order these problems? in some sort of tree, things which we have to fix all at once, and things which we can do the progressive enhancement? Uh, probably. Yeah. Hey, Alan, what was the question? Uh, the I question was, can we reorder the uh, to-do list into things that, uh, group them into things that have to be done together, and things that can be done uh, kind of progressively? Oh, OK. Like having the, yeah, no. the update mechanism is yeah. something we can keep building on, but uh, the next boot stuff is a bunch of this is all interrelated and it all has to work together. Right. Else the, the GPT boot stuff that implemented the next boot that you had referred to, mm -hmm. it's done really early and in a very simple way, but it's kind of specific. I'm trying to implement it in, U in UEFI land, which is both good and bad. We can debate that in a minute. Yeah. Um, but it is set up for a particular set of code. Um, and you know, we're not anything outside of GPT boot is not a good match. So whether or not is not a good match for right. that. So that's a, a caution. The GPT ZFS boot might be close enough that we can uh, deal with that. So this would help the use case, for example, of the pool upgrade to boot up and the loader doesn't work and you could fall back to the old one, correct? And not have support for the flag. Right. For that one, you'd want to do what uh, Mario suggested and take a checkpoint before you do Z pool upgrade sure. mm -hmm. so that you can undo the upgrade. But there would still be no way of right. automatically failing back. Yes. Uh, and so that's why. We would hope that with the updating mechanism that we defined, you would install the new boot code, reboot, and make sure it works, yeah. and then do the full upgrade. Yeah. Uh, and yes, we should. But those should be up automatically possible. So do like uh, type for it to reboot, or the line to like mm -hmm. right. It's not like yeah. If you if we had additional flag that's saying that we are upgrading the full. Okay, so, yeah. mm, you need because when you are doing the upgrade, uh, because when you are doing upgrade, the pool cannot be uh, mounted, right? Right. In process, it's, so. You can, I, you might be able to manage uh, rewind import in read only, but the bootloader or like the, the early boot stuff definitely doesn't have enough of a ZFS implementation to deal with. The freeing and so on. Yeah, but the, you only need it read only, so you might actually be able to import from a checkpoint in the boot code to deal with that. But shouldn't that pool upgrade not upfront check if you have the right boot code, and if not, then update the boot right code. now it does the opposite. So, so basically, <laughs> the basically what I was looking into, that, which I would like to uh, look into more a little bit more, is to add this checkpoint to the bootloader. So. Basically, this would solve the problem that you even wouldn't need. If you only have one checkpoint, really. Sorry? You can only have one checkpoint. Yeah, but if you would have a code in bootloader, which yeah. I will need to, uh, you know, a bootloader would be 
uh, would know that there is a checkpoint, and you just you don't need to mount even your file system, right? right? You don't even mount the need to mount it in read only, you just take it and you rewind it. That would be bad in the case where you don't do any checkpoint for. Yeah, but this is a option to close, right? So if you are doing the same with the snapshot, right? I mean, you also can lose data if you want. Yeah. You're less likely to accidentally keep an old checkpoint around because yeah. no space is free in the pool while a checkpoint exists. Yeah. Yeah. So you would run out of space and you realize, oh, I should get rid of this checkpoint. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, of course, it's, yeah. it's probably should occupy time to do if you want to do that. But Whereas if it comes up read-only, at least it comes up. But I guess SSH might not start read-only again. Uh, yeah, but you can just create like Run this guy. Yeah. So put all the uh, configuration kind of, there. Uh, a, a separate topic we've talked about is having an installer create uh, a rescue image uh, as, a sec uh, as an additional boot environment by default. And uh, one of the things uh, Delphix did with their appliance, especially the version they run in Amazon, which doesn't have any access to some kind of console, is it has a boot counter. And when the OS comes all the way up and manages to stay running for 15 minutes, they reset the counter to zero. But if the counter ever gets to four, then it doesn't boot the standard boot environment. It boots a rescue system that phones home and says, hey, come fix me, because I'm obviously not managing to boot. Uh, and something like that would also be useful. And maybe it could. Uh, yeah, well, at Pluto, we are doing uh, similar thing, but without the counter, we, we just basically have a console that you can enter the rest of mm -hmm. so. But yeah, in this case, it was Amazon. And yeah, we are not in Amazon yeah. yet. So. But they, uh, it was their workaround for the fact that they had no console, console or no way to, to indicate when to do it. So they just reboot it three times really quick, and then it boots in the rest of you. Yeah. In our case, we just can also have an API or something like that to, to do this. So, yeah. But uh, part of the idea here would be that you know when the system doesn't come back up, you don't have to go groveling around in IPMI. You just reboot it, and it comes back up in the, the previous state that worked. And then you can figure out what went wrong. So the question there is really about how much rollback you do and how much of that you rollback for the yeah. relatively rare situation where it doesn't work. Well, I think uh, doing an actual pull rollback is is more complicated than I've considered before today. Yeah. It's not uh, having a mechanism for it makes sense. I really don't think doing it automatically is a good idea. Uh, <laughs> or call from robot. <laughs> uh, but yeah, you know, for the BIOS boot case, I considered having two different previous EDAC boot partitions and trying to teach the, the PMBR bit to do the, the flags like uh, Marius does in with the uh, DVD boot. Uh, and so instead of selecting which partition to boot from, it's which partition to load the level the stage two bootloader from. Uh, and you'd have your active one and your next time only one. Uh, but that gets, uh, you know, you can't do that with EFI. Uh, and it gets a little more complicated. And so I wondered about actually, uh, for legacy boot code, ZFS has a reserved area of about 3.5 megabytes, which is more than enough in this case to uh, design or let blank specifically to hold boot code. Um, so we could consider instead of using uh, the previous DDEC boot, we would actually start storing GPT ZFS boot in that area in the ZFS label. Uh, and it frees up a couple of options. The main one is doing a uh, disk that's all ZFS without a partition table uh, so that it can be, when you replace a failed disk, you don't have to deal with repartitioning at first before you have ZFS start resumbering. If ZFS owns the whole disk, it can just replace the whole disk. I thought you were advocating against that, though. Like the dangerously dedicated thing? No, uh, well, if 
that's kind of a thing that's specific to the way previous D does. In if you use Illumo or anything else, uh, when you give ZFS to hold it, it puts its own partition table on it. Uh, it's actually a GPT, but it's uh, one that ZFS makes up itself, so it can do it on the blank disk. Uh, it's a little different. Uh, we're going to look at that a little bit. Uh, yeah, there can be problems with it, dangerously dedicated, although usually the problem is when you do that, well, there's still bits of an old partition table left over, and they don't get overwritten. And then Geom tries to open the partition table, and then won't let ZFS open the disk now, because there's a corrupt partition table on it. Okay. So ZFS is actually writing a GPT table. Yeah. Okay. Um, but Pavel interpreted what whole underscore disk meant differently than what people from Illumos meant to me. Uh, or just like your way that. Um, anyway, since then, uh, Thomas Su, who did a lot of the work on the previous C bootloader and ported it to Illumos, has added a, an option to ZFS. When it's creating its partition table, uh, it will create an EFI partition for you uh, on that. Of you can During pool creation, you can specify the size, but I think it defaults to 300 megabytes. They're about the same as what our installer uses, uh, so that there will be a place to put the EFI boot code. Uh, and so if we went to that uh, style where we have ZFS manage the whole disk uh, when it's a ZFS disk, and it gives us an EFI partition and a place to put the BIOS boot code, we could have it all managed there. And so we could also then have a you know, zpool boot code command uh, where you give it the path to the boot code and it would put it in the right place on every one of the disks in the pool. Uh, and that would provide us with the update mechanism as well. Although, when I envisioned that originally, I was still following the mechanism where when it's time to update the EFI boot code, I just overwrite it with a whole new fat image, uh, which doesn't work for having a failover. And you know, uh, for doing the BIOS boot code that way, using the 3.5 megabyte uh, area, we just have a defined offset of this is the first boot code, and this is the second boot code, <coughs> somewhere track which one's the active one or which one's the boot next or whatever. But that's not it's great. It's just MS-DOS, right? Like, can't you just rewrite it? Or move the new one to the, or move the old one to dot old or something and then write a right. new one? Yes, but the, the zpool command shouldn't be mounting a DOS file system and performing operations like that, right? So maybe instead of a zpool boot code command, we come up with a previous D command that does the right thing. But you know, it's got to determine just because you have a Z pool doesn't mean you boot from it, or you have three Z pools, which one do you boot from? Uh, and so on, to kind of decide which boot code to update and which one not to. But you know, if you have boot code installed on the pool that's not the one you boot from, but then the disk you boot from disappears or changes order, and now your BIOS boots from the other one. So one of those boot people that has a disk that goes off site, you know, like a three way mirror, and you remove one. And you're only rotating that once yeah. the uh, All kinds there. of things. And uh, it's <laughs> uh, how do we get the number of combinations down to a reasonable number so that we can actually write something that will update most everybody's boot code safely? So that number today is people have an image and a bad EFI presentation. Right. And that's, that's the massive install phase, isn't it? Um, well, no. Today we have people booting UFS or ZFS from MBR. Uh, and in the case of MBR with wow. ZFS, we're actually storing the GPT ZFS boot code, or above well, that ZFS boot, in that reserved area in the label in ZFS. Because with MBR, there's nowhere else to put it. Yeah. Uh, whereas if they're booting from GPT, we have the previous D boot partition, which either contains GPT boot for UFS or GPT ZFS boot for ZFS. Um, or they're booting EFI, and so there's an EFI partition, and that's where they boot from. Or the installer puts both so that your computer will work either way. Uh, and now, you know, when we have to update them, there's now, you could be using one of those eight different configurations. And then that's, we've only considered people have one disk. What about people that have more than one? It gets uh, complicated really quickly.
So then Thomas is done. Yes. And we'll do Mark, is it? Yes. Uh, and I, maybe it's not been ported back previously, but it's it's pretty trivial. It's just uh, on dpool create, you set an, uh, a property on the pool, which is like boot code size or something like that, and it creates uh, a reserved partition of the type EFI for that many megabytes. Uh, and because of the way we do things on FreeBSD, we might consider adding a second option like that to create a raw swap partition. Uh, so we can prefer that over uh, swap on a default. Yeah. So that's more in line of extending what the installer is always about. Moving functionality that's in um, DSD installing today yeah. into a SQL create. Yeah. yeah. That would be nicer because that's a pain to use DSD. Right. And the, the main reason to do that is so that when it comes time to replace a disk, ZFS can take care of it all, right? Yeah. Because uh, like the automatic fault management stuff that they completed for FreeNAS works great, except for you know when you have the partition, it's like, oh, we have to partition the disk before we can let it. Start resilvering, otherwise sure. it gets weird. Bonus point is you'll let us specify an alternate bootloader. Yeah. Who could put on it automatically in DFS? Because we have a hack version we put on the data disks, which boot out and say you can't boot on data disks. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Exactly. Uh, we would make the script take the which boot code to install as an argument because people have different versions and so on. We don't want to hard code that it installs just the boot code. It's yeah. A boot code. Yeah, a boot code. And so, uh, so one idea I had with the two different previous boot partitions, as someone has noted in the notes here, uh, the problem is that you'd have to implement the selection logic in the TMER, which is your basically your boot zero, uh, which you have exactly 468 bytes of assembly. Uh, and most of that are already used. Uh, so teach, it can understand uh, a GPT partition table. And look for, you know, FreeBSD dash boots uh, grid and so on. But teaching it enough to be able to read and write GPT flags as well is probably pushing it, and not, you know, judging by how long it took me to get uh, enough help to, for somebody to rewrite PMBR to be able to load more than 32 kilobytes of boot code, um, I'm not exactly bullish on the idea of. Of teaching a GPT partition table flags. Uh, and so at that point, I'm not sure how else we select between two boot codes though, without you know turning booting into a six stage process. <laughs> Use them all. <laughs> but it's like we'd have to insert something or, or either in boot one, which is another 512 bytes of assembly that just loads boot two and then jumps to it, uh, we basically have to make boot two the thing that does the selection logic and then have it jump to boot two and a half, uh, which then has the file system logic to load the loader, which is boot three, which then loads your kernel and jumps into it. And that's. We can rename the kernel to boot four. Well, <laughs> for renaming stuff, it, Kernel becomes boot five because we don't want to have to call it two and a half. It'd be three. The loader would move from boot three to boot four. It quickly gets out of hand. And then you reroute, get to boot. Yeah, the loader originally was called boot three. Yeah. For a very short period of time until the people that were working on it thought, I hate that, and changed it. 
But you know, when you say bootloader, people immediately jump to boot three, and it's like, well, you have to get to there from somewhere. And you have to bootstrap, which is kind of like boot one and boot two, but there's also boot zero. <laughs> it took up like two pages of my paper from HPSCon a couple years ago just describing how your computer turns on. What? If, because uh, in GPT you have a uh, two copy of boot code. We could. You, uh, you have two different copyrights because. Oh, you mean the. I, no. Yeah, boot code we only have, have one copy. We have to put it the partition table. Um, right, because that's the, the first uh, 512 bytes are our PMBR. And the, you know, yeah, but you have always alternative one, right? The alternative one is only the partition table, not the boot code. We only write the boot code once. Really? Yeah. Oh, that's besides. Yes. But towards that effect, we could continue to have a FreeBSD dash boot partition. So the PMBR doesn't change, and that FreeBSD dash boot partition. It's just enough logic to do or decide, you know, which of the GPT ZFS's boots to grovel out of the, the ZFS label. Yeah. But that's adding yet another stage, and that's yeah. Uh, right, right now for the UFS case, mm -hmm. you know, the GPT boot is put into the FreeBSD boot partition, and that is what <coughs> figures out the boot the, the, the boot bag stuff we use for things like NVSD. Yeah. Uh, but it has the advantage of it generally doesn't change. But like the, the UFS GPT boot that goes for UFS in the FreeBSD dash boot partition actually contains enough UFS code to be able to read the loader and the kernel out of a UFS file system. Uh, whereas if we inserted yet another stage, we would not need to do that part for it. But are you saying that? Yeah, it seems to me we're at a point where the effort to maintain the old stuff is substantial, and I just wonder how many people today deploy ZFS to MVR. Uh, not MVR, but GPD booting on modern hardware. That's how all of mine work. Yeah, because the whole legacy boot stuff is... Right, I'm still legacy booting, but with the GPD partition table right. and the newer code, just I'm not using EFI because it either only existed on half the machines when I started, or in half the machines it did exist on, it didn't work properly. Yeah, the, um, even GPT booting has a protective MBR at the front that is used to get the system started. And the PMBR that we talked about earlier is the thing that goes out and looks at the partitions and finds which one to load into memory. And it loads up to 520 kilobytes in yeah. memory and jumps to it. And that, that's the, it reads the previous D dash boot uh, partition contents and then jumps into them. Right, my bad. Yeah. Uh, but I, I get what you're saying. It's like we should probably be putting most of our development effort into UEFI. Uh, but at the same time, we don't want to mm -hmm. have too much feature disparity if we can avoid it. And mostly it's like I still boot all my machines the legacy way, but I shouldn't. My laptop doesn't because I boot up an NVMe, so it has to be EFI. And it works reliably now. So it is true that maybe we should stop spending too much effort on the, uh, the legacy case. Yeah, I think the machines that are uh, doing legacy boot will be around for quite some time. Yeah. Uh, so I'd be careful in saying we should stop. Um, with that. Right. And Everybody knows UFI is the future, and Lord knows our UFI implementation can <laughs> use some of that. Um, but uh, I think we're still probably five years away from stopping active development on the uh, MBR legacy side of things. Right. Because of the way it is, I'm not sure if we want to 
increase the complexity by having too much of the failover stuff. Uh, but I agree that we're a long ways away from being able to, to not worry about the legacy boot kit. Yeah. Having a failover, you know, it, it's suggested that there's a little bit of data in the boot partition that we can look at that tells us which half of the boot partition to boot from and that we install into the one side and if we, you know, tried to boot that before and failed, then we um, fall back to the old boot code. I think something like that would not be hard to implement and would probably fit into the space constraints that we have. Um, it's post uh, PMBR, so we have enough room, but it's pre getting the whole system up, so we can, you know, toggle at that point. Yeah. That adds an extra step to the boot process, but it's a, a short one, so it's probably okay. Uh, so the other one we looked at was uh, when Warner and I were working on the, I think it's test slash boot. Uh, we wrote a script that enumerates just the different partition layouts you could be trying to boot from on AMD64. Uh, and it, it, the number gets uh, out of hand pretty quickly because you could have uh, MBR, GPT Legacy or GPT EFI or MBR EFI, uh, each of which either get encrypted or not, and then for MBR, there's four different boot zeros you could use. Uh, there's the one that gives you like F1 for this disk, F2 for that disk, or the one that doesn't. And then there's one that's compiled to output the F1, F2 on serial or not. Uh, and so, and then whether you're putting UFS or ZFS, uh, and I think it ends up with 64 different possible combinations of boot code. And we generate a little QMU image of each one of those, and then try to boot it. Uh, but I made the mistake of trying to make a version of GPT ZFS boot that outputs uh, the password prompt for Gelly on the serial console so that you could type in the password. But as uh, the reason why there's a separate boot code for MBR for having serial or not, uh, I quickly discovered was that if you just enable serial, uh, half the machines that don't have serial will just hang trying to enable the serial instead of erroring out and continuing. Half of them will work right, but half of them won't. Uh, and so you know, if you look in slash boot, we already have lots of different versions of different boot codes. And I didn't really want to add yet another one of, you know, GPT ZFS SIO boot uh, that happens to give you this serial console. Uh, and quickly gets out of hand now. Uh, but yes, I think the, the approach is to have some intermediate step that lets us choose from our, you know, active and secondary boot code, uh, and I guess maybe the right way to do that is uh, a boot selector that we put in the previous C boot partition, and it goes and grovels out of the uh, the two different locations we specify in the uh, ZFS label, and maybe reads data we put somewhere else that tells it, you know, which one's the active one or which one's boot next and so on. Uh, and part of this, especially if we're going to start putting stuff in the ZFS label, we might want to talk, uh, bring this up at the ZFS leadership meeting and look about trying to accommodate this across the different operating systems. Uh, with Alula, it would be pretty easy now that they're using the previous e bootloader. Uh, but coming up with something that makes sense for uh, the other uh, consumers of ZFS as well, uh, might be useful. Uh, for example, the where, area where we write um, which boot environment to boot at one time uh, with the ZFS boot CFG tool uh, is the same spot that Delphix writes their boot counter. And so I'd already talked to them before about the idea of training that instead of right now it's literally just the raw string written into the, a certain offset. Uh, and they're just putting a raw 64 bit integer in that offset. Uh, instead making that like a packed NV list where we can actually have structured data where you have key value pairs of a couple of different settings. Uh, and maybe that's the right place to indicate, you know, which of the two boot code areas is active or even uh, making it more flexible and saying here's the offset and the length of the boot code 
uh, for each one. Which I, uh, Aluma says something like that uh, with their version. Um, and so we have an array of these are the boot codes that exist in this defined area, and this is which one is active, and also we're saying boot next, this one, or whatever. Uh, but the disadvantage to doing a more complicated data structure like that is uh, in the case of what we do now, after we boot it once, we just write zeros over it and update the checksum. Whereas if it's an NB list, we have to have all the code to parse and construct a new NB list with the next boot part taken off and jam it back in there. And that's exploding the size of the code again. And, uh, uh, Marius, how, how big would that be? Sorry. Uh, if we used a, an NB list to have a bunch of settings for boot written in the ZFS label, the amount of code that we need to put into like the boot selector to be able to read that and modify it and write it back. Depends how many types you would like to support. If you would like to basically support a whole heap NB, then I think a few kilobytes. I don't know if it's a reasonable approach to do it that way or not. But basically, you probably would like to have two values, strings, and numbers, right? Yeah, yeah. and maybe arrays of strings or numbers. The question is, do you really care about arrays? If not, you probably could basically not. add some other values, you know? Yeah. So yeah, I think we could have uh, limit that quite. quite uh, right, well, you yeah. know. We have quite a bit of room anyway. Yeah. Uh, the previous e boot partition isn't it isn't limited big. anymore, right? Yeah. It, well, it's 500 kilobytes. Okay. Or 512. Uh, you know, we don't want to put too much complexity in the middle stage of the bootloader that we just inserted, but uh, That's having a, make it kind of future extensible is kind of useful. Don't we have? Uh, ZFS and delete already some parts of it? Then? Oh, probably, actually, yes. Uh, at that stage, we were already using the ZFS and delete. Maybe we, we could use that. Possibly. Uh, in the selector version, we were not going to have the ZFS code, that would be in the next one, but that might be. But yes, it proves that it, it works. <laughs> so, yes, I forgot that we already had that to read the, the pool config. Yeah. So yeah, that might be the right way to do it. And then uh, we'll coordinate via the ZFS leadership meeting on maybe defining. Uh, I would prefer our, our version of Fleet NB, but. I, I think we, we would use that in our boot code just because it's yeah. smaller and easier to get just that. Uh, but if there would be a problem with the size, I guess we could use I don't ZFS think, as well. I, I, there, now that I think about it, there won't be a problem with size. Yeah. It'll be almost the only thing we have in there. It's like that and enough of dbt.c to be able to read the partition. Or, no, we don't even need that. So yeah, it's going to be almost nothing. Uh, and then if we can define a common set of keys that are available to every operating system, and then you know, FreeBSD can have its own additional ones uh, if it wants or whatever. That might uh, give us the, the most flexibility. Uh, and because we're using something like an MB list, it means that an uh, older loader can still understand the keys it knows about and just ignores the keys it doesn't, and gives you more of a chance to boot than to just say, oh, the size of the struct changed, so I have no idea what this is, which is how most of the <coughs> code works now. Uh, there's a bunch of code in the loader. Uh, it gets passed from GPG instead of boot into the loader. Uh, and it's a struct, and the first element is the size. And if it doesn't match my definition, then I just don't access any fields past what I know about. Uh, and it's kind of hackish. Yeah, the problem with the size is that it can change in different ways. Like yes. You can just change the type really? of the value or something. Right. So, uh, but there wouldn't be case. so having some magic or whatever. Right. In, yeah. But yeah, and this would work. Much. Uh, and it's something that's already heavily used in ZFS, so it's not something new or weird. Yeah. It's not JSON. 
<laughs> Jason's not new. I know. <laughs> it would be uh, new for Karen, though. Right? <laughs> it would be new for the boot. Yeah. yeah. Or, sorry, I'm not advocating strap. for it. I'm just saying it's not new. <laughs> the bootstrap that loads the bootloader doesn't need a JSON part. What? Everything needs to parse it's JSON. It's still better than XML, so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Every, everything expands until it can uh, send email, except for Exchange Server. <laughs> well, it's, it's meta at all. It's, it's to the, losing your mail for you. Prevents you from getting email. Puts down on spam. Phone number you want to start to buy down that is easy. Yes. Uh, so in, in general, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, the idea would be instead of having two different uh, previously dead boot partitions and trying to teach the PMBR to you know, choose between them, uh, and then the other idea was moving the boot code into two different offsets in the ZFS label, uh, and I think we've decided that we have to do both. Kind of. So we'll continue to have, instead of getting rid of uh, previous dash boot will continue to have it, and it'll be a small bit of code that just has the logic to go pick which of the two offsets in the ZFS label contains the boot code we should be using this time, yeah. uh, and some other configuration that we can put in an list, which would be likely the starting offset and size of each of the boot codes, and maybe because there's enough room, it can support three if we really want to, or something. Uh, and then the next boot flags and stuff like that. Other than Marius, who's going to help me do that? <laughs> Does anybody want to poke holes in that idea? So uh, normally this chain starts with some handoff from the lab, so you don't really need to worry about like the legacy codepaths. But if you are doing some kind of uh, parsing ZFS stuff in some bootstrap stage, then uh, it's at least a consideration that you may wish to give some thought to, which I haven't thought of yet. Yeah. There was a paper about some of that from uh, somebody at semi in, in Tokyo. Uh, and then you know, Eric McCorkle, who did uh, some of the work on EFI, has also been interested in the, the TTM and stuff, uh, and the uh, verified booting and the thing. But yeah. <laughs> yeah, in that case, having the bootstrap process be traveling around for extra config probably is not a great thing. That would be for the EFI case. Suppose we could have an option that doesn't do that. But I don't know how many other things we'd have to disable for uh, that type of setup. So I imagine we'll end up with a specialized version of EFI boot that removes a bunch of the stuff uh, from the process. Because I think mean, even loader.conf is slightly problematic in that case, right? Uh, it doesn't have to be. So if you just slurp in the unparsed 
form and hash it and XMPPR would tell you before doing anything which like before doing like complex parsing on this or whatever. Um, then that will at least have your TCAM civil secret so you no longer able to write that thing is different. So uh, like your um, the the only case we probably care about is if I slipping off of some file system that you have to parse, you can still do that. Uh, you just need to have good folks. Log that you're doing it first. Then. Yeah, and then when you're when you're talking about the ways to automatically update your good code, um, some hook in there so that you can also reseal whatever secrets you had to whatever you you expect that you think their values to be would be something. Right, so that when the EFI stage loads your new loader, the hash has to match, otherwise you can't access the secret. Yes, also, uh, which with whatever config stuff you're measuring, mm -hmm. um, having that go through the same resign patch, or re resealing patch, rather, would be uh, likely desirable. Yeah. Luckily for the EFI case, we're having two different EFI loaders on the EFI partition, we're not going to have to travel around in the ZFS uh, in the in the file system to get the config uh, for the EFI case because we use either the non volatile uh, non volatile web memory NB bars in EFI to indicate when we want to change, uh, and so those can be logged that way. Uh, and on the the ARM case where you don't have uh, not all the storage, then I don't know. I guess your computer secure good in that case. If you don't have somewhere to store that stuff. Well, um, yeah. so TCAMs have not the tell storage on them, um, both like general NVRAM type things, but also monotonic counters. Um, and so when the idea was brought up earlier of having that the uh, like reset it three times quickly instead of having a bad thing. Uh, this is just an idea that I've not fully thought through uh, yet, but um, those one of them counters could be used to prevent rollbacks to uh, previously valid good configurations that you don't want to continue to be valid. Um, and so you could sign some kind of manifest saying, uh, yes, allow this boot once at this uh, value of the boot counter, and then you would allow it to boot once of that testing thing without also allowing that path to be valid uh, in case that, like, you determine that that's actually not what you want to be running. Mm -hmm. uh, I wonder if that would work for the, the like, one-time passwords we were talking about for Jelly. We have a counter we could confirm what you're going to be able to go backwards. Uh, you mean the OP, not uh, yeah. uh, we'll that because okay. we was talking also at Azure Beat come to use TCM to store the uh, right. jelly. So yeah. yeah, something like that might work. Mm -hmm. Sorry, unrelated thing that your idea sounded like a good solution for. So how does that work in <coughs> So QNV does have a device model for a TCM, but they're not for sure, and I'm not aware of anyone using it besides for testing development of boot campuses. Um, generally, your trust anchor is somewhere outside the VM, and it's like, well, OK, I'm loading the. Yeah, it probably don't want to trust something that is fine. I don't think anyone just really wants to trust something running a VM. Yeah. Generally, the annotation doesn't happen. Uh, the annotation of guest state doesn't happen from within the guest itself, but rather you have some out of band thing that says, yeah, they do all, so you, you do remote annotation of the host, and then you trust the, when the host tells you I've loaded this guest, that it's actually the guest that it's loaded. 
that's way too far off the food chain for, like, if it, there's enough dynamic branching that's happening in your system already anyway with food scripts and stuff that uh, having uh, TPM sealed secrets at that way late stage doesn't really make sense anymore. Uh, the thing in my mind is the sort of branching of this tree of a lot of foods and maybe eight different combinations of that, and now the, the really good idea about handling um, using these um, counters to track how far you know, there's a food that there's a failure, and then thinking, well, that's not the only information, not the only place I want to use that, it's not just targeting. I also want to use these counters in um, the infrastructure. So I'm having to have another set of duplicate code paths, the TPM hardware world and the non TPM hardware world, plus the other mile about persistence storage. And we're trying to do this in slightly exaggerated type of tools, button control telegram, touch button, button control tab. That's starting to grow a lot. A lot of code branches to maintain. Right, well, well, in the non secure case, we wouldn't have to use the counter that way. No, you wouldn't have a flag that says, next time you did a different thing, and then as soon as you read that flag, you erase it, so that the next time you go back, you do the default. Yeah, the RAM constraints would, unless I'm missing something about your use case, wouldn't matter in the end case anyway, because at that point, you have a trustee that trusted you for space, which implements your higher layer attestation stuff anyway. And basically, you can just check this in the user log, so right, so that's our data, which Probably what we're saying to exist or whatever, and you already pass the all the stages of booting, which you trust, right? So when you stick to this or whatever, you can trust everything which is there, right? More or less. Better than before. Yeah, better than before. But it wouldn't make sense. And especially that you would need to have, like, store the data for every machine you are booting so in this world mm -hmm. environment in your PM, so it would be kind of complicated to create that. The specific scenario I'm thinking of is where I'm running the PM inside someone else's phone and I don't I don't much process Yeah, yeah. so uh, we were thinking about this is why I don't know the implicated cases where that's necessary. So, for example, you are buying some hosting somewhere and you want to be sure that kernel is good, so the kernel you will use, right? So, uh, we're thinking more about having uh, some um, uh, some code in the boot code which will do some measurement uh, about the kernel and so on, and then uh, it will contact some, some of your servers that you have a device to give you this measurement, and then enable them the, the server will provide you the master key to set with your, your state. And the cache will jump, yeah. Something like that. But that trusts the layer below, that the bottom layer on the remote system that's doing that measurement is trustworthy, and that's not necessarily the case. So yeah, so, so basically the idea, because there is no good, uh, good way of doing that really, so the idea was that you, the, the system, it's hard to tell the, the underlying uh, hypervisor what you will really measure, right? So every time you basically, you, you, when you are installed, you're collecting a lot of data, and then you are asking about few of them, not about all, the, all of them are all, all the time. So it's a little bit security by obscurity, but. Yeah, that was fun. I mean, um, so there, there are, there's a better way. Um, yeah. So if you, uh, it requires that you, at some point, have some physical control over the, the machine. So, uh, but you don't have when you are yeah, buying, you know, buying. So, so okay, so or or some trusted delegate does. Um, so when you permit the machine, you steal a uh, remote station. Updates to it, you reseal it to the main state, and then when you are booted, uh, yeah, but you how you can trust uh, TPM will show you, you know, because every time when you can, if you can update the TPM, that's the cost also comes, right? Only from a, so, it, yeah, so you need to be 
when, when you provision the secrets into it, you are already in a trusted state. And so yes, you need some way to bootstrap that trusted state in, in the first place. But, but, but what if it's not yours, you can never get yeah, it. Yeah, that's the case. Which, which is why I can emulate right, a CPM and yeah, take all your shit. Right, which is why I said in the beginning, you need some point at which you or some trusted delegate has some physical uh, assertions over the box. Yes. But that is the case if it's your box, and uh, that can be the case on behalf of the cloud provider if it's someone, some, some provider has some marginal trust in what you said you've got on the table. Oh, for sure. Um, right, exactly. Better than just please bring this back to me. Like this is what I expected. You have a cryptographic chain of trust instead of just a unauthenticated chain of response. I actually wish I had my other laptop with me because um, I have a thing where I replace the uh, BIOS with. With the Linux payload. Um, so I can, without a hard drive physically in my computer, I can like bootstrap the book writing that'll be very easy. Um, and the point of this is that I can load my kernel from my uh, real disk into memory. Uh, I cache it, I extend that to my TPM. Um, and then, before, and then I would can exactly boot it. But before I do that, uh, I I unseal a secret, um, which I use to as, as a um, seed for a time-based two-factor authentication token, and then I can with my phone do a pseudo six-digit pin thing and check if it matches what my computer is displaying to me before I enter my full list of current account phrase. And with that, I have a cryptographic verification that my uh, firmware and uh, kernel that I'm about to load from disk is uh, the one that I personally have signed. Um, What's the pin? Just to because you're just uh, checking the um, hashes which you calculated, right? And yeah. it's, so, what is the problem to just print you the hashes without doing all the stuff? What, what do you mean? Stuff? Right. I just print you the hash and you. No, you provide the key. I don't measure anything, right? Oh, you just you just like observe yeah, what's yeah. printed on the screen, yeah, yeah. right? Well, so it's the the secret is never printed on the screen. The secret is sealed in my TPM and then used to generate the one-time code. So I, I see some results of computations from that secret, and then before I jump to my actual kernel, I erase that secret yeah. and and extend the PCR again. The, the platform is very clear in the register with it, my secret is sealed to you again. So that after that point, once I'm in my my actual kernel, I can no longer read that secret back to the TPM. So I just get a signature from it, and not a never, never the secret itself. It'd be cool to have some kind of schemes like this in FreeBSD as well that do rely on a bunch of extra kernel things. Yeah, it's yeah, we've looked at a couple of ways to try to do stuff like that, but the full disk encryption part. You know, have a key as part of, and in addition to the passphrase, so that you always lose who you want. Or, you know, a hardware token and a password token. Mm -hmm. So the problem is that this, we, Every time you need to rehash, uh, re encrypt the, the, the master key, so, right. so it cannot be like time based. Right. And if you will mess up the event base, then you just don't have the master key anymore. So, mm -hmm. so. so last one, the building a tool to let you update the boot code. What kind of user interface do we want for that? And what are the complications of that?
just clear. The problem with how manual it is now is, uh, especially without the fail-safe systems we've been talking about all day, is when it goes bad, you basically need to boot up a USB stick or something to solve it. Question. <laughs> uh, is break time? 2.30 on the dot. Yeah. Uh, we have a half hour break, uh, and then in here will be swap state menu. Sorry, what's here? Uh, swap space management. Um, networking continues in this big room, and uh, across the road here is testing and CI. So we're, we're starting a half hour away on the swap group, so we're starting it at a half hour? Yeah. Uh, we're starting it on time at 3 o'clock. It's 2.30 now, right? Okay, I thought it was supposed to start at 2.30. No, uh, we're, we're, we've just run out of time for this group, and then we have a half hour break starting now, and then uh, uh, things start on time in 30 minutes. Yeah, I read, I read the schedule, but my mistake. Uh, thank, thank you everyone for coming and for helping out. And hopefully we'll have something to show in not too long.